So if we were in regular conditions, we'd have children coming up to the front. Well, we can't do that. They won't let us do that. And we'd have somebody singing and they won't let us do that. At least not in this service. We can do it in Sabbath school. Outside. And that's why we have our Sabbath school outside so we can sing five or, five or six songs. And it's really special. But we can still gather. Nobody's telling us we can't gather in the name of Jesus. And when they start saying that kind of stuff, you'll know where the bullseye target is on this thing. It's already looking pretty suspicious, but people keep moving forward. Churches keep struggling and dealing with children. Right now, the children's ministry, we can't have children's Sabbath school right now. But hopefully we can do that soon. And praying, and, and I, I heard that this is a second wave now of the coronavirus in, in many places is what they're saying. So we've got to ask God for a little more patience and a lot more wisdom and a, just a ton more of love and forgiveness. Amen? We're going to continue today on our uh, spiritual gifts, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit series. And in Sabbath school right now, it was just occurring to me how that there are so many gifts of the Holy Spirit that we don't even acknowledge or recognize as being gifts of the Holy Spirit. How many of you remember what it says in, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and it says, and the Spirit was hovering up over the waters, over the waters of the deep, and the Spirit was there, and it and then on that sixth day, God took the dust of the earth, the minerals and elements of the earth, and he molded a man, and then he breathed into him the breath of life, the ruach. The, the Hebrew word ruach is breath, and it's the word we get spirit, uh, the spirit of God, the ruach of God, into Adam's life. And ever since that day, God has been breathing himself into us, into the human family. And the spark of life, the energy of life, the, uh, the, the spiritual aspects of the breath of life. Now, to, to verify this, you can look in Genesis 1, and on day 1, God separates the light from the darkness, and he says that he saw the light that it was good. He didn't put the good label on darkness. Well, four days later, he creates the physical light of the sun and the moon and the stars. So he, he I believe, he was talking about the spiritual light was good. Spiritual darkness was the rebellion of the Antichrist, and it was not good. So it's the only thing in God's creation that wasn't classified as good. Everything else got the good stamp on it. And the fourth day, again, was the physical light that we all need, even plants need it, to grow and to photosynthesize and to produce oxygen for us. They take in the carbon and other things and they produce oxygen for us and all these things going on. It's the greatest oxygen machine in the universe, God's creation. And I've read that and I look at that and I believe that everything you and I are able to do is a gift of the breath of life that is in us, including unbelievers. They couldn't breathe if the Holy Spirit wasn't in them because he is the life-giving representative of the Godhead. He's the one, he breathed the Holy Spirit and man became a what? A living soul. And, and unbelievers have these same gifts of life. He causes it to rain on the righteous and the wicked. 
the just and the unjust. So God causes it to rain on them and not just physical rain, Holy Spirit rain, because Jesus, uh, Peter quoting from Joel says, in the last days I will pour my breath, my spirit, my ruach upon all flesh. Not just the believers. So it's a gift of God to be able to breathe. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit in us to be able to breathe. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to hear if we have the ability to hear. There are deaf people who have lost that gift. And, and for whatever reason, uh, whatever has happened, some people cannot hear. And we have our deaf ministries going. It's a gift to be able to see. That's a gift of life, the breath of life. Uh, we talked about in Sabbath school this morning, we talk, I, I talked about the gift of eating. I believe that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't be able to eat if he didn't teach me how to eat. Babies wouldn't even live very many days if, they, if the Holy Spirit didn't teach them how to eat, how to nurse. What, what do they call it? They, they, these, these abilities or these born with abilities, instinct, well, God calls it wisdom and knowledge beyond their ability to understand. Babies don't understand what they're doing, but they know how to eat because the gift of life is in them, which gives them this ability to eat as much as it gives the baby abilities to breathe. All good gifts come from where? Above. From the Father of lights. It's plural. Lights. And you know what I believe? Jesus, in one of his uh, presentations, when he's talking to the disciples in this big group, he says, you are the lights of the world. You're the light of the world. You're all little lights. Jesus, Jesus said that he was the great light. I am the light that shines in the darkness. John said he was that light that shone in the darkness in John 1. But at, at times he would tell the disciples, you are the light of the world. The believers. In a, in a, in a dark place. In a very dark place. So all good gifts come down from the Father above. All good gifts. Gifts. Is it good to be able to eat? That's a good thing, right? I believe that as a gift from God. Is it good to be able to remember something? I believe that's a gift from God. It has to be. Because we can't produce these things. And God causes these gifts to be manifested in the, in the unbelievers and sometimes wicked unbelievers. There are some unbelievers that are more wicked than others. Because they do more wicked things. And, and I can verify this because Jesus said, those who commit many sins will receive many stripes. Those who commit fewer sins will, be, will receive fewer punishment, fewer stripes. And so I know that God has these calibrations. But the real question is, what, what, what gifts do I have, do you and I have, and, and am I... Am I improving? Am I increasing in those gifts? Am I growing in those gifts? Now, you want to be careful how you grow in the gift of eating because that can really come back to smack you. We want to, we want to grow with, with great wisdom in the gift of eating, right? Balance and understanding. The Bible has some pretty serious things to say about gluttony, and, and, and another word that I, have to, I had to look it up, but I now know, surfeiting. So I used to think, well, that can't be surfing, because I don't have a surfboard, so. Uh, gluttony is eating too much of anything, and Jesus put that, puts that in the same category as drunkenness and sexual perversion. Now, that's pretty wild, but that's what he does. This is the, the people who need help with that are the same. Gluttony. And then surfeiting is when you eat too much delicacy stuff, too much fine stuff. Like, like when I was a kid, 
I got a paper out. I was in fourth grade, and I always had money, always, because I was always collecting from my customers. And so I always had cash, and I was a young fourth grader, fifth grader, and sixth grader. I, I did it till the eighth grade, but I always had money, and so I could always buy ice cream bars. I could always buy whatever, candy bars, Reese's peanut butter cups, whatever. I could always buy all that stuff. Anything I wanted, I always had it, I, and I bought it every day. I ate candy every day. I ate a lot of candy. I ate a lot of ice cream bars. I ate a lot of fudge sickles. I ate a lot of that stuff. I mean, I, I, would, I would actually, I'd actually have a kind of an unwritten schedule. Uh, one month I'd go with just uh, Butterfingers. The next month I'd go with Snickers. I didn't do Baby Ruth very often because that just something wasn't right about that Baby Ruth candy bar. But I, I, I just had, but it always, always, the go-to was Reese's peanut butter cups, always. Especially if they were just slightly melted and you just stick it in your mouth and wow, it just does amazing things. But I know now that I was surfeiting. I didn't know it then, but that's what surfeiting is, is just you know, scheduling your life around delicacies and fineries and fancy foods and la, 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 la. And so if I hadn't have been in, so involved in athletics and so involved in physical exercise and coaches that were running the daylights out of me almost every day, blah, 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 I would have probably been an early diabetic patient, you know, from that. But physical exercise has some way, uh, it does something, it triggers things in our bodies that it can counter, at least for a time, it can counter our bad eating habits, at least for a while, it seems. I mean, there seems to be some evidence for that. And I watched that growing up. My uncles all lived into their 90s. My uncles and aunts all lived into their late 90s. And, and, and they drank quite a bit of beer and quite a bit of alcoholic beverages and all that. But these people worked like a rented mule, like somebody who had rented a mule. You know, they work rented. You, if you rent a mule, you work a lot hard. You work the rented mule a lot harder than you do your own mule because you're going to take the rented mule back. And these people work, they, they just work, work, work. They're the hardest workers I've ever seen. And you know what paid off for them? Because all that beer drinking and sausage eating and shrimp eating and cow beef eating and all, that would be the worst diet in the world. And they were as healthy as George Burns. Oh, there's another one. So somehow people say, oh, well, they cheated. No, they didn't. They balanced the scales with physical exercise. It's a big deal. Do you know, now, now I realize I'm not a doctor, but I've heard a lot of doctors talk about this, and I've experienced it myself, and I've watched it a lot. Do you realize that neglecting our physical exercise is like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day? That's what the medical world is saying. Wow. So I guess, I guess, Neglecting physical exercise may be surfeiting in a roundabout way. But God has given us all that we need to succeed physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Amen? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs 21. It's pretty easy to remember this. It's 2121. And I, I just, it's so awesome that when Jesus comes along and visits the earth as, as a human, he magnifies all these things in the Old Testament, and he really magnifies this verse in the New Testament. Let's look at it in the Old Testament first. Proverbs 21, 21, he or she who follows righteousness and mercy finds life righteousness and honor and some translations say prosperity well i think that we need to look at the magnifying glass because jesus is the magnifying glass he came to magnify the law and the prophets he didn't come to do away with it he came to magnify it he came to make it even bigger to make it, he came to make it even look more clear and and show us how to apply this thing and how it really works when you get a hold of Jesus. So in Matthew 6, this is kind of easy to remember too. So, so we got Proverbs 21, 21, and now we got Matthew 6, 33. 3 plus 3 is 6. So if you can just remember that, 
Matthew 6, and then another form of 6 is 3.3. 3. So you can always be able to look at that. It really is in the Bible. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of Elohim, of God. And Elohim is in the plural, but if it was a Hebrew word, it would be Elohim. If it was Greek, it would be Theos. And I, I, I think theos is a plural word too because there's three of them who unite to become as one. And he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, of the God head of all three, and his righteousness, his way of living, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, all the things are listed above there. Jesus just told them, you're worrying about the food you're going to eat. You're worrying about the clothes you're going to wear. You're worrying about what kind of house you're going to live in. He says, just seek the Lord. Just seek God, and you'll get all that you need here in this deal. And then in Matthew 19, 29, just in case we didn't get it, he, he repeats it towards that section. And 19:29, of course, is the year of the great stock market crash that began the Great Depression. And in 1929, Matthew, he says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. So we're talking about spiritual gifts. How well are you using the gifts that God has given you? Well, I, this, this can even address, if you're an unbeliever, this even addresses you. How, how are you using what the holy God of heaven has given you? Are you being a, a balanced steward, care, caring over whatever God has given you? But especially for Christians. I, I thank God for moms, I should have heard some amens even with your mask on. I should have heard some amens on that one. But anyway, I'll let you guys worry about that when you get home. I thank God for moms. and I, There we go. And I thank God for wives. Amen. There you go. You guys are quick. And I thank God for my wife because in November after Thanksgiving, she came up with this idea that, we were going to go keto diet. And I tell you what, I, I believe that it has helped me become more healthy than I've probably ever been in my life. This keto thing. Now once in a while, see, we're, we try not to be extremists, you know, fanatic extremists, because we've done all that before, at least I have. I don't know about her, but I've done all that before with the health thing. I've been a complete quack and an extreme psycho. And so... We try not to do that now, so we eat a little ice cream on the weekends and, and uh, some potato chips once in a while. So we're not, you know, freak out, whack out, keto psychos. But it, it helps to find uh, something that, that works, right? And to experiment with it and enjoy it. Mostly modified keto. Mostly modified keto. Oh, with low carbs? Yeah. All right. So he who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you in balance, in, in wi with wisdom. It will be added to you with, with wisdom to know how to use it without it cursing you. It cursed King Solomon for many years because he somehow... he. He turned away from his wisdom. He had, it was, had the greatest wisdom, a gift. God says, what do you want? I'll give you anything you ask for. And he says, well, I need wisdom to rule your people. So God gave it all to him, but he neglected it. He didn't, he didn't improve his serve. Like in tennis, you know, you, you, you do this serve. You do, and these guys can serve 150 miles an hour. It's incredible. And they can, they can pinpoint those Tennis balls, I, you know what? The only way I would ever be able to return one of those balls is if it hit me right there. Because there's no way I'm going to hit it with this. I'm not quick enough. Anyway, we need to be improving our serve. 
on the things that God has gifted us with. And he gives us, he says, seek, the, seek me first and I'll give you all these things will be added unto you with great wisdom. The ability to use it properly, to use it to glorify me, God, and to use it to tell others about my son, Jesus. Or to bring others to All the gifts we have are, to bring, are designed by the creator to bring him joy and pleasure and glory and honor and power. And it's all through the Bible. It's all through the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation. It just explodes in the book of Revelation. And they actually, at times in the middle of these great visions that John's having, there's this huge worship and praise scene in heaven, and it says these very things, the very words. You are worthy, the Lamb, you are worthy, for you have created, you have created all things, and for your glory they are, and for your pleasure and your, your honor, and, and for you. Everything's been created. And if you really want to be happy, you will put him first in everything the same way he has put you first in everything and me. It's like you can't, you can't be more fulfilled and more excited and more happy and more adventurous you can't do you, you can't have the full potential that is there unless we you and me put Jesus first so somebody says well I don't have any gifts well you're just sadly confused because God gives gifts to every person. Even unbelievers he gives gifts to. We, we just went over that. And he, he says it in special ways all through the Bible. I pour my spirit on all flesh. I cause it to rain on the, on the just and the unjust. And he's not just talking about physical rain. He lightens every man who comes into the world in, in uh there in, in John 1, chapter 1. And in Romans 12, he actually says that everyone's been given a measure of faith. So that's a gift. There's a lot of gifts that God's given us. We just need to uh, exercise. We need to practice, improve. We need to improve them. We need to improve upon these gifts. Now, now there's something really interesting to me that Paul found this group of people in the book of Acts. And... They were pretty righteous. They were living uh, wholesome lives in, in, in the Jewish way and in, in, in honor and integrity. And, but they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. And Apollos had been the preacher, and he didn't know about the Holy Spirit yet. And so he wasn't able to really get them uh, flowing and, 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 and growing and, and moving out like the, the, the believers in the upper room were already doing all over the world and all over the empire. He wasn't able to really inter, get them energized and, and ignited, so he wasn't able to do that. But Paul was. But when Paul met these people, he, he preached Christ, and the Holy Spirit came upon this group of people the same way he did in the upper room, and they just exploded with the, with the glory and the power and the faith and the faithfulness and loveliness of Jesus. And then he tells us, and I'd like to, like to turn there with you in Timothy. Timothy was one of his, uh, may have been his number one disciple, may have been his first lieutenant type thing, you know, and they were so close that special letters that he wrote to Timothy were placed in the scripture, in the Bible. So, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul, Paul he, he understands how a lot of these, uh, he, he understood a lot. So he's telling Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, 
according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare. You may fight a good battle. How many of you know we're in a, we're in a war, we're in a battle, we're in a combat zone, and there are many casualties, and there's a great enemy, but there's a greater, we have a greater captain. We're in a war, we're in a combat. Having faith and a good conscience, verse 19, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So there was still hope for them. And Paul says he literally gave them over to the devil for the devil to work them over or do something to them so that hopefully they'd come running back to Jesus. That's heavy. And I think we need more of that. I think we need more individuals who know how to do that. And that's pretty deep stuff. But he says, uh, Timothy, I want, you, I want you to pay attention to these things you received according to the prophecies that were made over you. Now, how many of you know that everything I just told you from the Bible... Everything that we just went through and, and, and showed examples of and talked about is, is prophecy. I'm not a prophet, but the Bible is full of prophecy. When someone reads the Bible, someone's, they're reading prophecies over you who have ears to hear. If you, if you receive it, you're hearing promises of God. You're hearing truths from God. You're hearing truths about God. These are the prophecies, prophesying. So, Timothy, you said under these things. You heard these things. You know these things are true. And, and, and you, need to, you need to pay attention to this so that you can fight a good battle. So who are we, who are we at war with? The enemy, right? The word Satan is the word enemy. It means enemy, literally, enemy. Satanas, Satan is the word enemy. We're in a battle. 1 John 3, 8 says, that Jesus, for this purpose, Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. So that's a fight. That's talking about a war. That's talking about destroy. He, he, Jesus came here to wage war against Satan and to destroy his works. 1 John 3, 8. And so we're supposed to be fighting this battle. We're supposed to be in this warfare. And, and we, we get better at it the more we hear the prophecies of the Bible the more we hear them and the more we receive them and the more we do them, the more we become doers of these prophecies that we hear when we, when we hear the word. And then, and then in, in chapter, uh, well, we'll go here first. Chapter 4, verse 14. We actually had this one in Sabbath school, but we'll hit on it in a minute, just a second here. He, and here he gives a commandment on this. He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, which was given to you by you hearing the word of God. You receive this gift by simply hearing what God says. That's what it, prophecy means, a word from God. Prophecy is something God is saying. God is the, is the one. The Holy Spirit is the one who prophesies through somebody. And if, you, if all you do is read the word over a group of people, they are hearing the word from the mouth of God. And, it, and the Bible calls it prophesying. He says, he, says, uh, he says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely, give yourself entirely to what you hear. Everything you hear from the Bible, give yourself entirely to it. And that your progress, that you may, you may progress, you may improve, you may mature, you may learn how to operate in these gifts. Amen? One of the greatest enemies of mankind is is being uninformed. That is a nice way of saying being ignorant, being uninformed, uneducated, being un uneducated. And there's so many examples of that. 
I, uh, we, we have to learn, right? If we keep repeating the same mistakes, are we, are we, are we learning? If we keep, okay, I, I was in Little League, and, and I, I'm blind. I, I was like almost blind in my right eye, and I'm a right-handed batter. And they'd throw the ball at me, and I had to hit it out here or else I could never hit it because once it crossed this plane right here, once it crossed here, I couldn't find it. My right eye was gone. It was just wasn't no, I couldn't. I always had to hit the ball out here. Therefore, the ball always went over here towards third base, a left field. But I didn't do it because I wanted to do it. I just thought the only way I could hit the ball is if I hit it quick enough out here while I could still see it with my left eye. Well, I never, I, you know, I, I, I thought I never thought that I should be batting left-handed. I wish somebody could have figured that out for me. But I was a little kid. How do you figure that stuff out when you're a little kid? I didn't figure it out. And now. When I go to the batting cages, I haven't been to the batting cages in probably 10 years. But when our boys were growing up and they were in uh, our, our schools and we had the baseball stuff going, the softball stuff, we took them to the batting cages. And I said, man, those batting cages are 80, 90 mile an hour. You know, I, I'm old. I don't think I can hit them. And I could hit them once in a while, but I'd usually not hit them very good. I thought, well, I got to try this left-handed. Maybe if I maybe I can hit left-handed because my right eye is so bad. I went left-handed, and I'm telling you, out of 20 balls, I usually never missed a single one because my left eye was 20-20 and it was picking them up. Boom! And I could actually knock them over the batting machines and you know get them up in the air. And that, that's that's what you're trying to do, right? Well, guess what? I didn't learn that playing baseball. I learned that playing ping pong. You remember Carl Carnes? You guys know Carl? He is like, he's in his 90s, I think. The guy is a, is a, he's a, he's a machine. I mean, seriously, if you, how many of you play ping pong? Okay. This guy can compete with anybody. He puts spins and he sets back, like, like if the table, here, let me show you. Like if this is the edge of the table, I'm always up here, you know, playing like this. He's back, he's back like, you know the guys in the Olympics? They go way back and they're playing back here, you know, and the ball comes, oh, and, he's like, and that's what he does. He can do that. And the ball can come way down under the table and it'll boom, and it'll boom, and then it'll go boom like that. You don't even know what to do. And so I had to improve my game. And, 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 and I still couldn't do anything. But there was a while, He'd play left-handed, or he'd just go easy on me. And I realized, playing ping pong, that if I didn't hit the ball here, I couldn't find it. My right eye, couldn't find it. And so I started playing like this, giving myself an edge, but I still couldn't do it as good. And that's what tipped me off to what was going on in my batting game. But if I hadn't have learned that, I, I, you know, my sons would not want me to be batting at the batting cages with other people watching. And there's some value in that, right? How are we learning? Are we learning from our, are we learning about our weaknesses and how we need to adjust or how we need to uh, shift something here or pay more attention there or do something different here in order to do a better job for Jesus and, and the people who need Jesus just as much as we do? Are we improving our skills and our abilities to, to use what God has given us to point people home, to point in the direction of home? And that's where Jesus is. That's home. Home is wherever he is, and we need to be pointing people that direction with everything we've got. And so that's why he's telling Timothy these things. He's saying, don't neglect this gift. Don't neglect any gift. Be superb. Be excellent. Set your sights high because Jesus is the goal. He is the prize of our high calling. He will transform us into his likeness if we set our eyes on him, looking unto Jesus, Hebrews 12 says, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him did not despise the shame and the agony and the humiliation, but because of you, you're his joy that was set before him, he endured the shame. And 
and the humiliation. So, in 2 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. And just a little side note, if you didn't bring a paper Bible or a digital Bible, or if you don't have the entire Bible memorized, I would recommend bringing a paper Bible or a digital Bible because you're cheating yourself if you don't make a few little notes or something and make this more, more important and more real to remember what you heard. And no matter who you hear from, it doesn't matter who you hear from, just remember what you heard. So, for what did I say, 2 9? I can't even. 1 what? Oh, 1 6. There it is. Okay. Oh, again, it's like he's repeating it. He says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I tell you exactly why he put verse 7 in there. Because we're in a war and a war is terrible and it's vicious and it's violent. And you can't win if, you, if you're fearful. You can't win. You got to have boldness and courage in the time of judgment, in the day of judgment. And you got to go forward. And here you stir up the gift that is in you. The greatest gift of all is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what Colossians 1 and 2 says. He is the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. And, and so stir up Jesus Christ in you is what it's saying. Well, how do you do that? You just surrender and say, Lord, I want more of you and less of me. Lord, lead me out. In the, and, and, and here's another way that a lot of people don't see this, but I want to tell you something. There's some spiritual leaders who don't know how to transmit this. They do not know how to impart these things. They don't even teach people about these things. And what you need to do is you need to get around a person who's functioning and operating in these spiritual realms and at least preaching about it, and at least praying about it, and at least praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit every day. You need to get around people like that and say, hey, lay your hands on me and pray for me the way Paul did Timothy. And you know what? You might find somebody who says, what are you talking about? Right here, First, 2 Timothy 1.6, he received some gift through the laying on of hands. Now, do you have to have Somebody like the Apostle Paul to lay hands on you to receive this gift? No. The guys in the upper room didn't. They prayed for each other a lot for 10 days. Peter was preaching to Cornelius in Acts chapter 11, I think. And he was just preaching Christ. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and he didn't lay the hands on them. The, the gifts of the Holy Spirit started manifesting in them. He didn't lay his hands on them. So they were able to do that. The, the people who were baptized by Apollos into John's baptism hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit. They were pre he was preaching Christ crucified to them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't lay his hands on them. But for some reason, Timothy was in a situation where that needed to happen. I don't know why. But God doesn't put himself in some little algebraic formula or a mathematic equation. And for Timothy, he received this gift through the laying on of, Paul says, the laying on of my hands. So, maybe that's why Jesus says in Mark 16, these signs will follow those who believe in me. They shall lay hands on each other, lay hands on the sick. You know, seriously, I remember when I was a little boy growing up in the Lutheran church, we used to play church. My, me and my brother and my, a couple of my cousins, and we would play, pray church, play church. And we'd pray for each other and we'd do all this stuff. And... It was, it was pretty cool. I mean, I enjoyed it. I remember it was an enjoyable thing. But pretty soon that became 
it wasn't politically correct, let's put it that way. It didn't become so popular. Hey, sweetie, there you go. I don't know where you're going, but you're going. She's gone. And there's, and there's Grandma. And there's only good angels back there. So you don't have to run. I'm sure she's going to be good. Maybe somebody should head her off over here. <laughs> oh, seriously. Oh, now here she is. This has got to be part of the sermon, you know. She has no fear. It says, it says there is no fear. Right? Well, she just showed us. <laughs> Wow. Uh, uh, uh. That is so special. Thank you, Ellie. Is that Ellie? Thank you, sweetie. You sure gave us a joy. Nobody ever laid hands on me, when, they have, but I mean, for this, nobody ever laid hands on me for me to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit when I, when I received the Holy Spirit. And it's like, I didn't know hardly anything. I really didn't know hardly anything. All I knew is that I had been sprinkled in, as a baby and that that wasn't in the Bible and that I needed to get water baptized and, and fully baptized that was in the bible and i and i heard I, I heard why i was supposed to get baptized but that really didn't make a lot of sense all i could do was tell the preacher that was telling me all this stuff so well i don't know i said you know i, I really want to i really hope i can do this i want this to work so yeah let, why don't you baptize me let's see what happens i don't know i'm so my life is so messed up and and god's mercy is so great and I was in that, that stock tank. It was a, a tank that you used to water horses and cows and stuff. No, it had never been used for horses and cows. The church was so poor they didn't have a baptistry. It was a dirt floor. There was no ceiling. You could see the rafters. And there was this squeaky little wire came down. And it was wired to this light bulb. And there was not even any tape on the wire. I could see the wires. And that's the only light we had in that little church where they met. In a dirt floor in his garage. That was their church. And he had told me about the Holy Spirit. He taught about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he says, he says, well, you need to be water baptized. And, you know, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I said, well, I don't know about all this Holy Spirit stuff, but I do know I need to be water baptized. Let's just do that, and we'll, we'll see what else comes later. And so he didn't push me. He's the sweetest, most precious, beautiful Christian you could ever meet. And, you know, I had been praying because I've been hearing from all these different Christians. So, oh, no, you don't want the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's satanic and that's not real. That stopped. With the, when the apostles died, that's no longer available. You, know, you don't want to get it mixed up into that thing. Those are demons involved with that thing. And then the other group saying, no, you, you can't, you have never had the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues. And I said, well, I don't know. That doesn't sound, that doesn't ring really clear to me. I don't think that's right either. But I didn't know. And I didn't want to get mixed up in the argument. I just said, well, it, just get me water baptized. That's what I need first. And I'll just, I'll, we'll see what else comes later. So I went down in the water. He put me down. And I came up. And all I could see, and you've heard, some of you have heard this before, all I could see was thousands of angels and Jesus right in the middle. That's all I could see. I couldn't see the ceiling. I couldn't see anything. There's the brightest, most powerful light I've ever seen. And all I do, all I, do, all I want to do, I was just, he was there. And I wanted to reach up to him, and you could never get me to raise my hands. I, there was, I had never raised my hands in church in my life, and I wasn't going to. Everybody was trying to get me to do it. In church, says, no, nah, I don't need that. I don't have, do I have to do that? No, you don't have to. I said, well, I'm not doing it. And so when I came up out of the water and I saw Jesus there, and I heard him say, I really like what you just did. I'm very happy with what you just did, I think is what he said. And I wanted to reach out to him. I was, over, I was broke. I was overwhelmed. And all I wanted to do was reach out to him. And I forgot that I didn't lift my hands, so I, I did it accidentally. And I, li I reached out to him, and I, all I wanted to say is, is, thank you, Jesus, and I love you. And that's all I wanted to say. 
And when I tried to say it, a different language came out of my throat and out of my mouth. And I knew it was a different language because I didn't know what I was saying. All I knew is what I wanted to say. I said, okay, here we go. I don't know what I've got myself into this time. The next day, I went to the foreign language department at Colorado State University. That's where I was going to college. I went to the foreign language department, and I'm telling you this for a reason, because you guys are going to have to struggle and deal with this. If you want everything these guys got, you're eventually going to have to deal with all this kind of stuff somehow on your own way, in your own terms, with God. Not with me, but with God. So I went to the foreign language department, and I walked up to the lady at the desk, receptionist, a couple of ladies, they were co-eds, college, you know, uh, student employees. And I walked up to them, and I remember they were both really pretty. And I also remember, but before I gave my life to Christ, all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do was talk to pretty girls and try to get them to go out with me. And I remembered that, and I said, and that hit me. And I said, I got, I got no time for that. I got God on my mind. And I didn't say that to them. That was all the conversation I was having in my own mind. Because we're under attack. We're in a war. And the devil was trying to sidetrack me to just focusing on pretty girls and going out partying. And I said, I, I, I said no, I got I to keep on focus here. I said, I, I, said, I, got, a, I got a problem. They said, what's that? This, this one said, what's that? I said, well, I got baptized yesterday on Sunday afternoon. And... Um, uh, I tried to say something after my baptism, and all I could come out was this, this foreign language. And it scared, the, it really scared them. I could tell they almost swallowed, their, they almost choked. I said, do you think you could help me with that? No, 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 but there's a, there's a guy down there, the, the, you go down there, he's three doors down, the right, go talk to him. They got rid of me quick. They thought I was a real basket case. I said, okay, thank you. And I walked on down, I knocked on his door, he said, come in. He was this old professor. I walked in, I told him the whole thing, what had happened the day before. And he says, so what do you want from me? I said, well, I want to know if what I've, what's, what I've got is real or if it's something from the devil because I don't want to get mixed up in any cult thing or any satanic thing or demon stuff. I said, I just need to help on there. And he goes, I go, I was raised a Lutheran. And he goes, I'm, I'm a Lutheran too. And he had this accent, he was from Eastern Europe, and he had this accent, real heavy foreign accent, and he said, I'm a, I'm a Lutheran too. And I go, well, you heard about this? Oh, yeah. Who hasn't heard about it? He said, yeah, I understand. And, I, and he goes, well, well, how can I help you? And I said, well, I'm going to pray. Is it okay if I pray right here and, and see if God will do something and see if you can hear this language, see if it will happen again, and you can tell me whether it's a real language or whether it's just a bunch of jibber-jabber because I don't want anything to do with a bunch of mumbling and jibber-jabber and nonsense. I said, it has to be a real language. I got nothing to do with it. He goes, you think, that? You think God would do that? I said, well, I don't know. All I know is I got to find out what's going on. Now, that's how innocent and ignorant I was. And he said, okay, I'll, 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 I'll do that. I'll pray. With, we'll, you know, pray." So we both knelt. I remember it like it was today. I was on this, this corner of his desk. He was sitting in the desk. He knelt, and I knelt on that corner. And I said a simple prayer. I said, Lord, there's so much confusion in this world. There's so many opinions. There's so many crazy things going on. I don't want anything to do with the devil or demons. I don't know if this thing is from you or from Satan. And I said, please, I need your help. If you can help me, please uh, do something here so this man can tell me whether it's a real language or not. And the Holy Spirit, as far as I can tell, I knew at the time, that's what it seemed like, the Holy Spirit rose or just uh, magnified or rose up in me. And these words came out, and I said it, and I, and, and I, didn't, know, I, didn't, know, I didn't know any foreign language. I, was, I could barely talk English. And, and so I, I felt this surge of power and energy in my soul. And, and when these words came out of my mouth, they were forever burned into my brain. I have never forgotten this. This was 1975. And I've never forgotten it. The words, Vladik Shnikna, Shnikta Aris Smignakt. And that came out of my mouth. I had no idea what I just said. Didn't have a clue. And that man looked up at me, and he was, he was you could tell he was sobered up. when it, He says, 
He said, how did you learn that language? And he goes, before I could even answer him that I didn't know that language, before I could even, he caught himself and says, there's no way you could have learned that language. And I go, why is that? And he goes, it's a dead language. I said, well, if it's dead, how do you know about it? And he goes, well, I just spent uh, a decade or so over in Eastern Europe studying this dead language. It died at the end of the 1800s. No one, everyone died off. It was a valley over there in Russia where they spoke this language, which is a mixture language of like three or four different languages that people had been there for three or 400 years. And there was this little group that had this funny language, kind of like Cajun or mixed languages like that. And I said, well, and he, he, he had done his doctoral studies in it or something. And I said, so can you tell me whether I said something real or was it just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo nonsense? And he goes, well, I can, I can tell you a couple of the words. That's all I can tell you. I can't tell you every word because it's a dead language. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, it's something about light shining in darkness is what you just said. And as soon as he said that, I knew, I knew the basic, what God had called me to be. He, and, and, and bear in mind, Jesus told the disciples, you are the light of the world. He told them, you guys are the light of the world. And I, and, and I didn't even know that, but at the, at, immediately I knew that I was supposed to let Jesus shine through me in the darkness that was all around me. Now, I know some of you are thinking, that's crazy. Well, that's fine. You're, you're an American. You've got the right to think and believe whatever you want to think and believe. A year later, and I didn't, you know, I didn't believe you were supposed to talk in public unless there was someone who knew the language that could interpret it. I, that's what the Bible said, so I was by the book. I was by the book. I said, I've got to let this, this teaching in first. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. I've got to let that be how this gift is used. I can't get caught up in all this. I mean, I went to gatherings where there'd be almost 3,000 people, and they would all be talking in tongues at the same time. And I knew that wasn't God, and I wasn't even a member of those churches. But several times in those kind of gatherings with literally thousands of people all talking in tongues at the same time, I would either go up and get the microphone and rebuke them and tell them this was against God and you shouldn't be doing this. And I wasn't even, I was just... I was just a visitor. But God put it in my heart to rebuke that, and I did it several times. They had this big group. You remember Full Gospel Businessmen? International? Millionaires. You couldn't even be a member unless you're a millionaire. Millionaires and billionaires. And they invited me because they I've been preaching in some of their churches. They invited me to come to their big meetings, this big restaurant, and these big multimillionaires, these guys educated from, they were from everywhere. It was a big meeting, international, Switzerland, Germany, South Africa, they were from all over the place, have this big thing, and they wanted me to come and share my testimony. And, and, and before I got to share my testimony, all of a sudden they were all talking in tongues. I, I said, okay, Lord, I said, that, that's not right. And he says, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I, I'm not doing anything about it unless you tell me to do something. He said, well, I want you to go up there and rebuke it. I said, okay. I walked up on the platform. I got the microphone. I rebuked it. I said, this is not from God. This is not of God. You are going against the word of God, and we shouldn't be, you shouldn't be doing this. So I know what's going on. But a year later, I was working with this guy, and some of you heard this, so bear with me. I was working with this guy from Korea, couldn't speak hardly any English. He had epileptic seizures, grand mal seizures. He was living on the street, and he would go into seizures in, in, in a, a hotel lobbies or whatever. And he, you know, it was terrible. His eyes would roll back in his head. His whole body would stiffen up. He'd almost bite his tongue off. That's why you're supposed to stick something like a piece of wood or something in there to keep from doing it. And, and I felt sorry for the guy. My heart was broken. He's a Buddhist, but my heart, I still felt sorry for him. So I said, well, he needs to have a room. And so this old cockroach hotel, I didn't have any money. I was a college kid. I'd already sold my car because I couldn't afford to pay insurance for it. So I was carless because I was in college and I didn't even have a car. But I had enough money to pay $5 a night for him to be in, in, a, in a room. And I was doing, a, I was doing a, in the basement of this old cockroach hotel, I was doing a mission there. Preaching Christ, inviting people to give their lives to Jesus. We sang a lot, some guitars and singing. We sang a lot. And, and, and he started coming to that because he thought I was Jesus. 
He literally thought I was Jesus. He was telling people I was Jesus. And when we were having our song service, he would literally come up and right in front of me, he would worship me. He would start doing this. He'd be worshiping me. And that doesn't work in America, in case you've wondered. That doesn't work in Christianity. So I was trying to tell him, no, stop doing that. You can't do that. And I, I'd go to his room, and we'd have Bible studies. He says, you've got to stop this. I'm not Jesus. Yes, you Jesus. I said, why do you think I'm? And he didn't hardly know English. I couldn't hardly get anything. He says, you give me food. You give me a, a place to sleep. you Jesus. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not Jesus. You can't do that. You've got to stop this. One day I was up there. I couldn't get him to stop. I tried to tell everybody in our meeting. I said, well, look, the, I, 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 he's worshiping me. He thinks I'm Jesus, but you, be rest assured, I'm not Jesus, and I don't want him to worship me, and I'm trying to get him to stop, but we can't kick him out. We've got to let him keep coming so hopefully he can get a breakthrough, get his head straightened up. So they, they trusted me, the group that was there. One day I was up in his room. Now, bear in mind, I know what most of the Christian world is saying about the tongues, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I understand. And I don't want to be scorned or ridiculed or branded a psychotic guru false prophet or something. So I'm trying to keep this low key. So I'm talking to this guy about it. I got him a Korean Bible, a Gideon's Bible, which on one side was English, the other side was Korean, and I was trying to show him in the Bible who Jesus was, and it wasn't me, and it just was not happening. It wasn't getting through. We were up there one day, and the Lord came to me, and he says, I want to speak to him. And I said, absolutely, I'm all for that. Speak to him. He says, no, 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 I want to speak to him in his language. I said, that's fine, too. Go ahead. You can do that. Speak to him. He said, no, 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 no. I want to speak to him through you in his language. I said, well, I, I know you can do that, but I'm not going to do stupid stuff. And I, I know I shouldn't be using the word stupid, but that's what people were calling it. I said, I'm not, I don't want to do stuff that's crazy and, 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 and stupid. I don't want to be any part of it, so it's got to be you, or, or you know, I don't want it. But he, he looked at my heart, the Lord did. And the Spirit rose up inside of me, and I think two or three words came out of my mouth. I didn't know Korean from Vietnamese, or Thai. I didn't know Korean from India. I didn't know, I, I knew Asian languages sounded, you know, Asian. And it sounded kind of like Asian to me, but who, who am I to prove that? And he lifted his head up at me, and he reached over and he got his engineering manual. He was a he was a he was studying to be an engineer, and he reached over and he got that manual and he he put it was all in Korean, and he said he he said, the, you you say you say, the words on the front of his book is what he said. I said I go well, it's news to me. And the Holy Spirit rose up in me again, and I for the next five minutes, four to five minutes. All I heard coming out of my mouth was this Asian language that I couldn't guarantee you what language it was. And you know, in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, if you speak in a tongue and don't understand what you're saying, pray that you may be able to interpret it. It doesn't say go to school and learn the language so you can interpret it. It says pray so that you can interpret it. The gift of interpretation of tongues is also a supernatural gift that can be done if you get childlike enough and humble enough and close enough to God, he can interpret languages that you've never studied or learned through the gift of the Holy Spirit. I have childlike faith enough to believe God is able to do that. At the end of that five-minute session, it was like I was empty. It was just flowing like a river for f almost five minutes. And when, when, when God was done talking, it just, whoop, and I was empty. Nothing more. I, didn't, I, would, I wasn't going to go on making up stuff. So it, it's, it, it was gone. He, he had his head down the whole time listening. When I got done, he looked up to me, and in the best English he could find, in the way he says, you not Jesus. He knew then I was no, he, that's what it took. God had to do that. And from that moment on, he was a beautiful Christian. Now, if that scares you, that's probably a good thing. Because this old world is scary. And sometimes we need sobered up a little bit on God's stuff. And all I'm telling you folks is this. You need to cry out to Jesus like never before because we need help like never before. At least in our lives. 
need to say, God, if, if, if that stuff that Pastor Paul said is real, then you need to prove it because if you don't, I'm not going to believe one word of it. That's how I prayed. I mean, that's how I prayed back then. I used to pray that way back then. And I can tell when people are not in the genuine because they're, they're, they're violating the Bible teachings on the, whatever gift they're violating. Whatever the gift they're misusing, they're not doing the word with that gift. Or they're not teaching it according to the word. It's not, this is not hard. Children can do this. Children can inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, you have to come humble like a child or you can't inherit it. So there's a lot of gifts. There's, and there's a list. There's lists of gifts, special lists. Uh, Romans 12, 6 to 8. 1 Corinthians 12 uh, has a lot of the gifts in it. And then 1 Corinthians 14 has a couple of sections in it. Those three places have specific lists and types. But there's so many gifts there's so many gifts. And, and here's, here's one of the most important things for you to take from this, today's service. You are a gift of the Holy Spirit for everyone around you. You are God's special gift. He packaged you. He designed you. And the people around you need what God has put in you. They need what God has put in you. They don't need what sin has put in you or what Satan stirs up in you. That's why we need to be stirred up in the Spirit. They need what God, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, has put in you. And if you don't let it shine, they're not going to benefit from your offering. Your, sacrif your sacrificial life. So there's a lot about the gifts. There's power gifts. There's speaking gifts. There's, there's uh, knowledge and understanding gifts. There's ministry gifts. There's leadership gifts. So many gifts. And we are, we, me included, folks, we are so uneducated on this. And that's a nice way of saying ignorant. And, and God says, and, and Paul actually says to the church in Corinth, I would not have you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. So I just want to encourage you. Don't ever let anybody teach you how to manifest a spiritual gift except the Holy Spirit. Don't let some pastor or somebody get you to an altar, or get you in a prayer meeting, or get you in a Bible study and say, here, just say these noises and then pretty soon you'll be speaking in tongues. Don't you ever do that. That is against the Bible. That is not, and that's what a lot of those churches are doing. That is not Jesus Christ and it's not the Holy Spirit. Don't ever let anybody try that. And if you know somebody who's received it that way, then they need to get free from that. That's not good. It's a counterfeit. Yeah, uh-oh is right. Here's what I believe. I believe that every believer has the blessing in their lives to be able to shepherd other people, to pastor, shepherd, to train, to to help educate, to teach, to mentor, to, to be an example to, so that others can become shepherds for others around them. Uh, you know, it, when God called me to be a pastor, I thought, how can that be? I'm the least qualified to be a pastor that I know. If anybody I know, I, I'm, I'm among the least. I'm, I'm least. I'm least qualified. I'm least qualified to, to shepherd or mentor or shepherd or pastor or train anybody. I'm among the least. But, but the faith of Jesus, the childlike faith of Jesus, can make up 
everything that is missing. Be of courage. Be bold. One final thing, then we're going to close. Peter said in his first sermon in in Acts chapter 2, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is promised unto you and unto your children and to all, as many as the Lord our God, who call from far off. We're the all. We're the ones from far off. We're 2,000 years away from that event. We're probably 6,000 miles away or whatever. So call on the Lord while he may be found. If you want power to attract other people to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is the answer. And, 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 and a daily refreshing and, and a claiming by faith that I have the Holy Spirit. He will help me. He will use me to attract other people to Jesus. That is so urgently needed right now. He'll give me the grace. He'll give me the ability to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's huge, but that's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and the greatest gift of all is salvation. It's, it's just forgiveness and grace and mercy and salvation. If there's anybody here today, you've never fully given your life to Jesus Christ. You've never said, yes, I want all. I want everything you have, and I don't want anything to do with sin. I want sin completely gone out of my life every day by you dealing with it, and I want everything you are and everything you have, Jesus, because that's what you said you'd give me. If you've never done that, I beg you to do it before you leave here today. And if you want me to know about it, I beg you to call me or, or text me or come up to, after church and tell me that you just did it for the first time, or maybe I used to do that all, but I haven't been doing it for years, and I'm doing it again. I, I, just, I just want you to pray for me. And I want to tell you this straight up before we close. No one needs or has to have my hands laid on them to receive the Holy Spirit like Paul did Timothy. Nobody needs that. I don't need to do that. But if God tells me to do it, I'll do everything I can to do that. I'm not looking for it. I'd rather, I'd rather see it happen just like it did in the upper room or just like it did when Peter was preaching to Cornelius and all of his family and household or like when Paul was preaching to the disciples of Apollos. I'd rather see God do it that way. No, that way nobody can blame me for anything and they can't accuse me of anything. It's actually the safest way to do this. So call on him when you're alone. See what he might do and how he would lead you. But it's always got to be with the word. Test everything with the word. Test it all with the word. And if it's a bunch of jibber-jabber that it's not a real language, you need to run from it and, and, and rebuke it and cast it out of your life. Don't go in those things. It's got to be a language, a real language. So if there's anybody here that we can't do altar calls because they don't want us doing that because of the infectious thing, and I respect that, and I respect people that aren't here today because they have high risk and they, they, they just, you know, they're being led by the Spirit. And I trust that. And I respect those of you that came today and pray that as you leave this gathering today, you will have greater ambition for Christ and for the people who need him just as much as you and I need him that you'll have greater ambition, greater motivation, that you'll stir things up, and that you'll stir each other up. Call each other. Stir each other up. Pray with each other like never before. May God help us. And he does. And I sure appreciate Don. Don, can you come up and play as we, as we close? And I'm going to have a prayer with you playing. I, I love when he plays. It's beautiful. And uh, just have this special song, whatever song is on your heart, brother. And then we're going to have this prayer. And if you want to stay in prayer with your family or loved ones, or maybe pray six feet apart from each other, we used to do that, not six feet apart, but we used to do the prayer thing. If you have time to do that, or maybe you want to pray by yourself after I say this simple prayer, please do that as the Lord leads. Let's pray. 
And yes, Don, you can go ahead and play as we. Dear Lord Jesus, dear Holy Spirit, dear Abba Father, we're all so thankful for the way in which you've come to our lives and the way you're leading us through this world and this time and this life. And we know that every good thing in our lives is a gift from you. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And we just ask that you will come among us and lead us in the footsteps of Jesus, in the footsteps of the apostles and of the early church so that we can bring you joy and pleasure and glory and honor and power. Go with us now so we can go with you forever. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. He loves us all. Amen. And you can stay and listen and enjoy the music too. <laughs>